Now today, we are starting a series called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. It's a very long name. And we're talking about how spiritual health and emotional health are related. I will be completely honest, this series scares me. It really scares me because anybody who knows me and Pastor Adam up in Boston and Cambridge might think that we are the least likely pe people to speak about emotions. Some would say we're, we're the least qualified to speak about emotions. But that's kind of the point. All of us, regardless of where we are, are on a journey of faith, need to bring our lives, excuse me, I'm going to adjust this, it's scratching on my mustache, and that's the <laughs> so <laughs> to avoid my mustache, there we go. My dad would look at my mustache and be like, that's not a mustache. <laughs> a poor excuse for a mustache. You should shave. And I'll say, Dad, it's my life. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> so, like I said, emotions, not my forte, and especially not Pastor Adam's forte. Uh, but we all need to, regardless of where we are on this journey of faith, bring our lives, every facet of, of our lives, to the scriptures and ask the question, what do the scriptures have to say about these parts of our lives. I'm nervous because I've, just even in my preparation for the sermons in this series, God has already, like a master surgeon, begun to take a scalpel and drive down to parts of my heart that I didn't know needed work. So I welcome you into that discomfort with me. <laughs> so for the next just numerous weeks, both in our sermons and in our groups, we're going to be diving into this topic, emotionally healthy spirituality. And here's the premise. Um, it's the same premise as a book by Peter Schizero by the same name, and we actually have them for, for sale back there. I would encourage you to get the book. I've been going through it. It's amazing, and it's really challenging me. Here's the thesis. You cannot be spiritually healthy without being emotionally healthy. That these two elements are linked. Now, we don't often think that this is the case. In fact, we think that spiritual health is often about overcoming emotions. It's about denying your emotions and fitting into a mold and mind over matter in order to overcome whatever hurdles you might have in order to be spiritually healthy. But what we're going to find out is that the scriptures do not paint that picture at all. And we, in fact, need to be emotionally healthy if we're going to be spiritually healthy. Now, what's at stake? Why would we kind of take the first step in this journey that's extremely uncomfortable, will open up some parts in our lives, in our hearts, that will feel very vulnerable, very, it'll hurt. Why would we do that? Well, if faith, in its most fundamental form, is a relationship, and it is, it really, really is. The endeavor to be a disciple of Jesus has at its foundation this idea that a human can have a relationship with God, and that acts as a fountainhead for the rest of life. It's this fundamental relationship from which everything else flows. If that is the case, we all know that in any relationship, self-knowledge and being yourself is an extremely important part of the health of that relationship. If you are struggling on the inside, that doesn't just stay contained. That is going to seep and leak into your relationships. And in fact, a lack of self-knowledge and a lack of what's going on in here can very, very often be the source of what creates relational tension. So if we endeavor to have a relationship with God, we cannot ignore emotions, suppress emotions, treat them like they're not there, or mishandle them and treat them like too big a thing, then our relationship with God is going to be strained. But if we move towards emotional health and therefore spiritual health, that means a stronger, more fulfilling, and life-giving relationship with God himself. So how we're going to do that through this series is we are going to look at different scenes from the life of Jesus and ask the question, how does Jesus, God incarnate, handle his emotional life? Not what are my opinions, not, you know, 
let's take slivers from here, 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 here. No, no, no. How does God himself handle emotions? Because we have a human example in Jesus Christ. So in order to get us started, this morning we are going to look at an example in Jesus' life that is fueled with emotion. Fueled. It is just jam-packed with emotion. So we're going to be in John chapter 11, and we're going to read 1 through 6 and 17 through 44. John 11, 1 through 6 and 17 through 44. The scripture is up on the screen here. You're also welcome to follow along in the Bible or on a Bible app. We'll be reading out of the ESV, the English Standard Version. John 11, beginning in verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Jumping down to 17. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise and quickly go out, they followed her supposing that she was going to to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did not I tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Will you pray with me? Lord God, would you teach us how to handle this emotional life that each of us experiences in a way that honors you and in a way that conforms to the image of your son, Jesus? God, we have so many preconceptions about what we are supposed to do to be emotionally and spiritually healthy, but help us bring those preconceptions to the scriptures and help us by your Holy Spirit 
Enlighten the eyes of our heart in this area. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. When it comes to emotions, the way that I deal with them is I ignore them. I, I do. <laughs> they are a hurdle to overcome. There's something in my way. I, I, I view life kind of like I'm, I'm this es- escapee from, from a labor camp in Siberia. And you're, you're escaping out and all these natural, you know, hurdles and the hunger. And if you can just keep on going, then you'll make it eventually. That's how I view em- emotions, like those things that challenge me on the road through life. But if you can just power through them, then they won't hinder your progress. And I think the most poignant example and experience I've had of this in my life was kind of late high school, early college years. I was living in South Africa at the time, like 17 years old, and I made a decision. I'm going to be the world's greatest drummer. It's just something you decide one day. Yeah, sure. Um, And the stepping stone for me when I began to research was to go to Berklee College of Music up in Boston. It's the preeminent school if you want to follow that path. So I went up there and I was living the dream. I was there. I was living by myself. I moved overseas. I was enrolled. I'd been accepted. Here I am in the big city making it happen, living my dreams. Now, about a week before class was supposed to start, I was sitting in the office of my finance counselor, and they said, okay, Justin, by Tuesday, you need to pay this much money. I'm like, okay, I begin filling out the paperwork to, you know, for, the, for the student loan to get it and get it started. And I realize my parents can't co-sign for me on the loan because my dad's Canadian and my mom is South African, and even though I'm American, figure that out, long story. Um, <laughs> but they can't co-sign for me on a loan, and in a moment, I realized this is not going to happen. Seven days out from the starting point of my dream, I see it crumble before my eyes. What followed was about two months of ignoring the fact that I was destroyed on the inside. I was angry, I was sad, I was confused, I was angry at God, but what did I do? I said, well, if I just, I'm okay, let's just keep on going. And I went to the gym more, and I worked at Starbucks more, and I spent every waking hour distracting myself from the fact that I was torn up on the inside. So during that time, my parents landed up moving from Cape Town to Nashville, Tennessee, and I thought, free rent, moved on down and started staying with them. And my first three weeks in Nashville, I got really, really sick, really, really sick. I was bedridden for two weeks straight, and we had doctors come and check out what was going on, and they could not figure it out. They said, it seems perfectly fine. There's no sickness. There's no kind of ailment that we can um, figure out. And I've come to see that through four or five months of stuffing those emotions, ignoring those emotions, treating them like something to get over and move on, resulted in just a terrible, terrible sickness. And my wife helped me realize this, who is far more emotionally adept (laughs) than I am, and just reflecting with people on it, I was absolutely heartbroken, but rather than deal with it rightly, I dealt with it wrongly, and my body let me know that I dealt with it wrongly. Now, each of us have different ways to wrongly deal with emotions. And some people might tend towards one end or the other, but we all need to realize that there is a healthy way to deal with our emotional life that won't result in what I experienced and won't result in what we all experience when we mishandle this emotional life. And what we're gonna see is that Jesus Christ himself, Jesus, embodies emotionally healthy spirituality and shows us how we can too. So let's go to our story here. What do we have? We have the death of a man, Lazarus, and Jesus loves, Jesus loves Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He's extremely close to them. In 
that's our first indication that Jesus is not what we sometimes view him as, you know, a Vulcan or a robot who feels nothing and shows no emotion. Throughout this entire story, we see that Jesus is filled with emotions, all different kinds. So we're going to see that as we go along. Jesus realizes that Lazarus is going to die, but he is going to, you know, spoiler alert, he's going to raise him from the dead later on, so he decides to stay. And when he does come, Mary and Martha's reaction shows us two very interesting opposite ditches that we can tend to fall into. So let's have a look at Martha, who goes first. She runs out and meets Jesus, and what does she say? Over here in verse, wrong page. I really need to preach messages where I stay on the same page. We'll waste less of your time. <laughs> I cannot get this open. Ta-da! All right, let's keep a finger over here. So, There we go. So what does Martha say? So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, he will give it to you. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And she says, yes, I know. He'll rise again at the resurrection on the last day. So what is Martha doing here? Martha is spiritualizing. She is taking her correct theology and she is applying it to the situation, and she is pulling herself up by her bootstraps, and she is trying to be brave, to keep a brave face, probably for her family, for those around. She's the first person who goes to meet Jesus, and she is going to keep it together, and I remember, okay, he will rise again on the last day, so I don't really need to be sad. I don't really need to grieve. I can get through this. It's simply mind over matter. That's the ditch I fall into. That might be the ditch that you fall into. That ignoring emotions, and if I can simply get past them and go through the right thought process to realize I don't really need to, f need to feel this, I don't really need to feel bad, I can get through it. So that's sister number one. Let's have a look at sister number two. Very, very interesting. When they come to Jesus, they say exactly the same thing, but look at the difference. In verse 32, now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She crumples at the feet of Jesus, and she is completely, completely emotionally just distraught before Jesus. And what has happened with her is that her emotions have completely bulldozed her. And grief has devolved into despair. Now, in Scripture, we find out that when it comes to emotions, there's this very interesting kind of middle ground that is the right way to handle it. So, for instance, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul says that we grieve or we mourn for those who have died but not as those who have no hope. Now, do you see here, if that's the middle of the road, Martha falls on this side of the ditch, Mary falls on this side. Martha is trying not to mourn. Martha is saying, it, okay, I don't have to feel these things, I can get through it, I know that I have the right theology, I, I can apply it, and I can get over this. Mary has let grief turn to despair because she is mourning like, like she is mourning big time, but not like a person who has hope. For her, it's turned into hopelessness and despair. And both of these are wrong. Now, it puts forward the question to us, I think each of us can identify with one of these two ditches, and maybe both in different ways at different times. So, how does Jesus react? If Jesus embodies emotionally healthy spirituality, how does Jesus react to this situation? It really isn't what you'd expect. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. 
Immediately when we hear that, we think he's weeping out of solidarity. He too is grieved at Lazarus' death. He, 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 he feels pain that people he loves are in pain. And although that is partially true, it's very interesting. This phrase, he was deeply moved. D.A. Carson, who's one of the foremost evangelical scholars, says that this translation is a cop-out. He says that this is actually making it really nice. What, how it should be translated is, he was outraged. The Greek word in extra-biblical examples um, comes from the image of a snorting horse. He was outraged. Whoa, what? What about, you know, Jesus is supposed to be meek and mild and compassionate and merciful, and he comes to a family who's grieving the loss of their brother, and he's outraged? That smashes our preconception of how Jesus would be in this type of situation. You know, gone is this picture of Jesus just always soft and gentle. He's mad. He's angry. He's livid about what is going on. Why? Well, he's mad at the way that the people are reacting to the death of Lazarus because they are not handling their emotions and their spirituality in a healthy way. Martha, by over-spiritualizing, is not feeling the loss of Lazarus. She's not feeling grieved. And that's not right. Mary, on the other hand, is mourning and grieving like someone who has lost hope, even though Jesus has constantly been teaching that there will be a resurrection where even those who die, if they believe in Jesus Christ, they will once again, they will rise when Jesus returns. So even though it's temporarily sad, it shouldn't devolve into despair like it is with Mary. And Jesus is mad. Now, how on earth is that a healthy way for Jesus to handle his emotions? And it begs the question, wait a minute, when I'm operating in an emotionally unhealthy way, does that mean Jesus is really angry with me? Maybe. But why? Why is he angry? Because we might think, we might think, okay, anger means you hate somebody, or you're, you kind of want to push them away, but the reality is that anger and, um, like, anger and love are not mutually exclusive. In fact, not at all. It's the people you love the most who can have the ability to make you the most angry. I mean, I, I served in youth ministry for a number of years uh, when I was younger, and a specific couple comes to, to mind, and their, their son, who was part of the youth group, and then went away to college and got involved with the wrong group and became addicted to drugs. And they were furious. They were furious at him because he knew all the right things to do, but he just kept on down this path. They were furious, and they were grieved and sad, and they loved him all at the same time. In this story, Jesus is angry and grieved because he knows that the way that Martha and Mary are handling their emotional health is hurting them. It's hurting them. For Martha and those who are reacting like Martha to stuff emotions, to keep them away is not to truly like, be your authentic self. Like Jesus wants people to be their authentic selves. They, he wants them to be fully human as he intends humanity to be. And that does not mean ignoring emotions. It means experiencing emotions. But he's also mad and angry and sad and grieved at Mary, whose emotion has completely overwhelmed her and crumpled her on the floor in front of him. And she has no hope. She's just filled with despair and loss. And he knows how emotionally harmful that can be as well. So what does Jesus do? If he's angry, how is he going to react? 
Because sometimes when we're angry, what we can do is we can get distance, right? I'm angry, therefore I'm kind of going to exclude you. So if Jesus embodies emotionally healthy spirituality, how does Jesus handle his anger and his sadness at the way that these people are reacting? Verse 35, shortest verse in all scripture, Jesus wept. Now this is beautiful. Um, When there are things in our life that are hurting us, Jesus weeps with us. Even if it's of our own doing, Jesus doesn't distance himself in anger, treating you some like some invalid that he doesn't want anywhere near him. No, no, no. What, what does Jesus do with these friends of his whom he loves, but who he's angry with? He weeps with them. He weeps for them. And Jesus does the same with us. When there are things in our lives, ways in which we are unhealthily handling our emotions, and it's hurting us, it's hurting our relationships, it's hurting our lives, it's hurting our minds, it's hurting our hearts, Jesus doesn't distance himself, he draws near, and he weeps with us. If, you know, What does Jesus do when he sees in our lives that there are layers of insecurity surrounding our hearts and our minds and the image of ourselves and what we're like and how will people perceive me? That saddens Jesus. He cries with you because he wants you to be fully secure, fully, fully who you are as he has designed you. What does he do when we bring emotional baggage from our family of origin into our current situation and it's causing strain and stress and tension like you can't believe and people are getting hurt left and right? Yes, he's angry, but he's sad and he weeps with us as well. What does Jesus do in the situations where some of us have experienced so painful a hurt and so shameful an experience that we're just like Lazarus wrapped in these linen strips. We are wrapped in layers of shame and self-doubt and self-hate many times. Jesus weeps with us. Jesus weeps with us. It pains his heart because he loves us so, 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 so much. But he loves us so much that he doesn't leave us there. It would be one thing if Jesus just wept out of solidarity and then left us there. Said, yes, to, to be human is to be broken. And therefore, I'm weeping with you. That does something. Yes, it, it endears us to someone. It's comforting to a certain degree. But if Jesus, you know, Jesus wants us to be what he's intended us to be, he cares enough not to leave us there. So what does he do? In verse 38, then Jesus deeply moved again. So these same emotions that are welling up in the heart and in the mind of Christ himself, they push him to do something. Then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb, and he is about to raise Lazarus from the dead. Now think about this. These people have just made him extremely angry with their reaction to the death of Lazarus. What he could have done is said, okay, you don't have faith? Fine, I'm out. You should have been, you know, do better next time. No, he says, you know what? As harmful as the handling of their emotions has been to themselves, because I'm good, because I love them, because I want to build their faith, I'm going to come through and I'm going to raise Lazarus from the dead and when they see my power, it's going to do something, it's going to do something in their hearts that will change them. It will change them. Because what's the root of the problem? If you look at Mary's re- reaction specifically, the root of the problem is that her reaction betrays a lack of faith. If Mary truly believed that Lazarus, even though he dies here, would once again rise again when Jesus returns and they would be t- together, she would not have the reaction that she's having. 
there would be, yes, grief, but it would not be despair. So this reaction, it betrays a lack of faith. And what Jesus is going to do is that by his power, he is going to act in such a mighty way that people's faith is going to be built up. People are going to see Jesus' power and it's going to change their hearts. Jesus' interest is in changing their hearts, changing their faith, so that they can then go down this path of emotionally healthy spirituality. He is going to embody it. He is going to show it so that people can follow in his footsteps because he doesn't want to leave them in the grief and in the despair and in the mourning, but he wants to bring them to a place of emotional health and of spiritual health. So what does that mean for you and for me? Well, the first question would be, which ditch do you fall into? The Martha ditch or the Mary ditch? I'm Martha all the way. I mean, Martha just, I'm way on that side of the road. Um, I want to give you a couple of steps here. And the first one is, I think we need to acknowledge that we have unhealthy emotional spirituality inside of us. That there are ways that we handle our inner life that are not in accordance with scripture, that do not please God. And that's scary because you think, ooh, I'm going to invoke the anger of God. Well, yeah, yeah, but hey, God already knew about it and it already saddened and angers him. But he doesn't push you away like some bad parent. He draws you close because he wants to help you change. That's step one, acknowledging the unhealthy emotional spirituality that each of us has inside of us to some degree. But secondly, is to give thanks at the graveside. And that sounds a bit strange, but look at what Je Jesus does in verse 41. So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Now Jesus has just been through a tornado of emotions. Anger, grief, sadness, the the overwhelming feeling that God's power is going to move through him and like so significantly that he's going to raise a man from the dead. There is a ton going on inside of Jesus. And what does he pause to do? To thank God. And the beautiful thing about this is that as we embark on this journey of pursuing emotionally healthy spirituality, God is with us. And we need to thank him. We need to thank him that he's with us. It's not just admitting, yes, I'm broken, I need help. But it's thanking God, thanking Jesus Christ for not leaving us there, but wanting to take us to a new place. And then the third one is very practical. You'll notice how when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, he, Lazarus comes out of the tomb wrapped in linen strips and a cloth over his face, and Jesus says to Lazarus' friends, unbind him. In this journey of pursuing emotionally healthy spirituality, you cannot do it alone. You can't. You simply cannot. So I invite you to join one of our groups. You might say, aha! There, there it is, this manipulation. No, we don't, we don't have groups so we can fill them up to be impressive with numbers. No, we have groups because discipleship is not meant to be lived alone. It's not the cart before the horse. Groups are the vehicle through which we experience the grace of Jesus Christ and moving towards the image of Jesus Christ. We have men's and, wim and women's groups that meet on the east side during the week, and for these next five or six weeks, we are going to be going through this process together. And trust me, you cannot do this alone. Why would you want to do this alone? Why not do it with others who can encourage you and who can, tell, who, who can speak words of life and words of truth over you and over those lies that you've maybe told yourself for decades? We need each other's help to experience, the God's, to, to experience God's grace in becoming emotionally and spiritually healthy. In a little bit, I'm, you know, we're going to pray and then we're going to sing, but I want to give you an opportunity to fill your information out on the front of those cards and then check the box on the back that says, I'd like to check out a group. 
And don't, it's not like, oh, how long am I c- committing for? Just commit for this series. Say, okay, I'm going to check it out for the length of the series and just see how you like it. Um, and here's what I believe is going to happen. In the same way that Jesus calls Lazarus out of the tomb and these linen strips that are wrapped around his body are taken off. Jesus Christ is calling you and me out of the grave of emotional brokenness. And he is going to take things that have been around our hearts, around our minds, around our lives for years, maybe even decades, and he is going to begin to unwrap them. Layers of insecurity, of grief, of shame, of guilt, of those things that are hurting us, that are putting strain on our relationships, that are preventing us from fully engaging in a relationship with God and with others, fully being able to focus on bringing God's purposes of beauty and restoration and goodness into a world that needs it so badly. First, God wants to bring us restoration and goodness and beauty inside. Jesus, the one who embodies emotionally healthy spirituality, calls to us, come out of the grave. Come out of the grave. Let me take these things, these these strips of death, let me take them off of you. And I believe that God is going to do an amazing work in your life and in my life through the series and ultimately through the life of Jesus because Jesus embodies emotionally healthy spirituality.